Well, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Open your Bible to 1 Corinthians and find chapter 12. We'll look at verse 1. We'll run over pick up a verse in chapter 14. You probably can guess the two verses I'm going to pull together here as I conclude. Did you hear the word conclude? We're going to conclude our series on spiritual gifts. Verse 1 of chapter 12 in the book 1 Corinthians, the Bible says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now chapter 14 and verse number 38. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Father, help me to preach with clarity now as we conclude our series on spiritual gifts and, and prepare our hearts for what you have for us in the upcoming weeks. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, thank you. you. may be seated. Well, I've enjoyed the series. I think it's been helpful. I believe that God has used it. I trust that he has. If, uh, if he has helped you in any way with the series, then praise God for it. Amen. Praise the Lord for it. We are going to do an overview of everything that we learned. I know those who have been under my ministry for any time at all get very nervous when I say things like that because that could be very, very intense. But it's not going to be. It's going to be a very super, uh, superficial, I hope not superficial. <laughs> that was the wrong <laughs> word. I truly hope not superficial. It's going to be a, a super high flyover is what I wanted to say. This is the epilogue to our series. We're concluding spiritual gifts. Unwrapping your gifts is the text. You have the text. You can go back and check up and you know, refresh your, your mind and your heart on thoughts and things that you've learned over these many weeks. So tonight we conclude with a review of what we've learned and then we'll talk about the meaning and purpose of gifts and finally offer a conclusion. And I'll let you know what, what's coming up. Um, in, in what follows, the ministry of gifts. What we learned, here we go. Well, we learned that there are three categories of spiritual gifts. There are gifts, and the word translated gifts there in 1 Corinthians 12, the first time it's used is charisma. And that, remember, is a quality of God that is expressed through a believer. It's when God manifests himself in terms of some specific quality. And then there are those gifts which are called administrations. Those are ministry gifts given to men, generally, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And then specifically to the local church, the bishop and the deacon. These are gifts God has given to minister to the flock. And then there are operations. And that's when God's energy bursts forth to perform a work. That's word of wisdom and knowledge, faith, healing, discerning of spirits and miracles. See how quickly we're going through? But I know you've learned so much that just by mentioning some of these key words, boom, tons of information is just ready to write. Okay. And then we talked about our motivation gifts, Romans chapter number 12. And we said that there was the prophet. We discussed how to identify yourself, uh, whether or not you have the gift of prophecy, and then the gift of serving. That was followed by the gift of teaching. We talked about the gift of exhorting, and then the gift of giving, and then the gift of ruling or administration, and then finally the gift of mercy, and uh, all that's done. Whew, that was fast. All right, and then discovering your spiritual gift. We gave you some tips on discovering your spiritual gift. We said there is the ask system, which is to ask and to seek and to knock. And we explained all that, and all of this is in your book, by the way. If you want a more thorough review, read the book. And then there's the priority principle. There's first and foremost the priority of our motivation. We need to be motivated ultimately by love. The Bible says that, uh, that you know, gifts are going to go away and all that kind of stuff. But faith, hope, and charity, these three, they remain. And charity is greater than all. And so ultimately, it's love must be the primary principle behind anything we do serving the Lord and, of course, in expressing Him by the spiritual gifts. And then... The other idea of the priority principle is God's priority in the use of gifts. Well, his priority, remember he said in 1 Corinthians 14, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye prophesy. Uh, to prophesy is to proclaim the word of God, to tell others about Jesus Christ or to communicate God's truth to others. And that's the priority. That's what we need to keep in mind when we're exercising gifts. And then there are three keys Three keys to discovering your spiritual gift. 
and they are desire, joy, and effectiveness. And we elaborated on how each of those help you work out and sort out what is your spiritual gift. And then we talked about the manifestation gifts, and we discussed them at some length. We identified the gifts, and we discussed how they interrelate with one another. We brought out the truth that God does use these gifts today in his church, we, but we need to rightly understand them, and we need to always remember to try the spirits to see if they be of God. So word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, discernment of spirits, these are enabling gifts that help us be effective in the work we're doing. And then there are the sign gifts, healing, miracles, prophecy, tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. And we've labored to help you understand that a sign signals something. I'm driving down the road. I'm looking for the sign that says, here's your exit. When I see the sign, I know it's time to prepare to get off the freeway. And the same thing is true of sign gifts. They signal something. They signify the fulfillment of prophecy. So when a sign gift has indicated its prophecy and that prophecy has been fulfilled, then that particular sign is no longer being used by the Lord as a sign gift. It doesn't mean he doesn't heal. It doesn't mean he doesn't do this, that, and the other, and so on. It just means that he's not using them as a sign any longer. All right, open your Bible to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, as we conclude now, our series on spiritual gifts, by discussing the purpose and the plan of spiritual gifts. What's the point of spiritual gifts? What are they all about? Revelation chapters 1 through 3. We won't, some of you who were here when I did our verse-by-verse -verse study of chapters 1 through 3 of the book of Revelation, remember that it was a whole year. I'm serious. We... We worked through those chapters in 50, actually 54 weeks. Wow. So we're not going to do that tonight. I'm just going to do a very quick overview of the content of these chapters to help us appreciate what's going on with spiritual gifts. Chapter 1, beginning at verse number 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps of the golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven go golden candlesticks. <laughs> Those are some golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. And then in chapters 2 and 3, the Lord Jesus Christ manifests himself to each church in a manner peculiar to their need and to the message of that hour or of that generation of believers. It's all about manifesting Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus Christ showing up in the earth today. It's all about Jesus Christ working through us to effect the will of God in the earth. We need to be mindful that spiritual gifts are about revealing Jesus, not revealing us. They do not work through the flesh, although they manifest in the flesh. But they do not work by the flesh. They work by the Spirit of God. So it's important for us to be filled with the Spirit if we're going to be exercising spiritual gifts. Let's take a look at this chapter. And, and I'm going to bring to your mind some things I'm sure most of you have heard me bring out before. But some of you have not. But take a look at this. The Apostle John was on the Isle of Patmos. He turned. He heard a voice behind him. Declare, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book, 
and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. John was arrested by the voice. He turned to see who it was that was speaking with him. One of the mysteries in the Bible is this, that when John turned to see the voice that spake with him, the first thing he noticed was an array of seven golden candlesticks. Why? Seven golden candlesticks, not a candelabra with seven branches, but seven separate individual candlesticks. Hmm. And he saw Jesus standing in the midst of these seven golden candlesticks. I don't know about you. And one reason I read through the what it is that John saw is so you could appreciate the point I'm going to make next. So I'll go back now to, well, I don't know about you. But if I turned to see a voice that spake with me and what was standing there or the person standing there had a face that was shining like the sun, I would blink at least once before I could even begin to discern his eyes in that face flickering like flames of fire. You, get, you catch what I'm saying? You ever look at the sun? You can't see anything but spots in front of your eyes for some seconds. I don't know about you, but I turned to see and I saw a, a face shining like that. I would probably wonder how it is that I'm noticing his eyes as a flame of fire or how I'm able to see anything. How I'm able to notice that his hair is white as snow, as white as wool. How I'm even able to discern that he has seven stars in his right hand. And I don't know how you can see something like that in his, in his garment, you know, uh, girt uh, to the foot and his, his paps girt about with gold and, and his feet is brass and, and then his voice is the sound of many waters. I don't know. If I turned in response to a voice that spoke to me like that, with the voice of many waters, I used to spend a lot of time at Huntington Beach on the shores, you know, the uh, cliffs, Huntington Cliffs, as a kid, go down there on the weekends and sleep there on the beach, and we had little places along the cliffs there that we kind of, we were like homeless people. We had little places there that we dug in and, and uh, made our little place, and we would sleep there uh, over the weekend. And, um, but I, 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 every time I read this about his voice being the sound of many waters, I, I can't help it. I remember how many nights I was sleeping in the sand and listening to the beauty of the rave, waves rolling in <clears throat> and how sometimes when the waves got a little rough when the wind got a little howling, and every now and then it would do that, even in Huntington Beach, not very often, but every now and then. When it did, man, those waves would, would well, they would roar. And I remember being moved by the roar of the waves, so I can really relate to, to this. And all of this is to come around to say, how in the world do you notice seven golden candlesticks? And then second, and perhaps even more significantly, how does that, how is that the first thing you notice? How is that even possible? Well, there's all kinds of impossibility in this whole scene here. It's impossible for us to look at something so bright as the sun and to have our eyes be able to focus on something so subtle as two little flames of fire <laughs> burning within that glare. It's impossible for us to see and notice hair as white as snow in a, when we're blinking in the brightness of the sun. It's hard, not even hard. It's impossible for us to even imagine noticing anything except, wow, my eyes hurt. Unless the Holy Ghost was involved in all of this, what do you think? Unless the Holy Spirit had especially anointed John to be able to see this with spiritual eyes, Eyes that would not be blinded by the brightness of his countenance. Eyes that would be able to discern all these things. And so that means that in that moment when John turned to see the voice that spake with him, the Holy Spirit said, hey John, see this first. The seven golden candlesticks. 
Look at that first. See that. And then see who stands there. Wow. That's amazing, isn't it? I look at verses 19 and 20. Verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And that outlines the book for us. And there's three major categories. But did you notice that verse 19 does not end with a period? It ends with what you call a semicolon. So it hasn't concluded its thought. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And the way the next clause picks up after the semicolon is almost abrupt. It would seem that he left the point and went somewhere else. But we know that he didn't. And he says, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. Now there's the period. And so what this sentence is saying is this. What you're going to write about, you're going to write about the seven golden candlesticks and the seven stars that I hold in my right hand. That's what you're writing about. Very interesting. John, here's what you're going to write about. You're going to write about those seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks that the Holy Spirit brought your attention to as the first thing to notice in this vision. For us, it's all about Christ. For Christ, it's all about us. I don't know why. I can't explain that. I'm not going to try. But for Christ, this is all about His churches. So when we read through chapters 2 and 3, we must appreciate that. The significance of the churches to Jesus. It's huge to Him. There are all kinds of important things we can, we can take from this study. One is churches, not church. We use the word church, and we use it in a generic sense to refer to that institution Jesus Christ established in the earth. But that institution Christ established in the earth to which he, had given, he has given the keys of the kingdom and anointed by the Holy Ghost and commissioned to go forward into this earth, representing him and so on, is organized in churches. Individual, separate churches. We're not looking at a candelabra with seven branches. We're looking at separate candlesticks, each standing on its own base, each separate. Churches. The church is organized in churches today. Again, we use the word to speak of the institution of the church, much like you might say Sears, and you, you mean the corporation called Sears. But when you go to Sears, you don't go to the corporation, you go to a store. And when you go to church, you don't go to the church, you go to a church. And so the Lord's churches are established in the earth and commissioned by Him to go forward and advance the cause of His kingdom. And as you know, our purpose is to declare the terms of surrender. Jesus Christ has come. He conquered the devil. He took all the kingdoms, all the power of the earth is His now. And He rules and reigns from heaven. But the people of earth holler back, will not have you to reign over us. And they rage and they fuss. And they will not submit to Christ. They are energized by the spirit of Antichrist. But the spirit of Jesus Christ is here holding back that spirit of Antichrist. And so there's a war between the spirit of Jesus Christ and the spirit of Antichrist. And the church is his headquarters in that war. The church is where he's focused. We do not see him standing in the midst of the council of the UN or standing in the midst of the of NATO, some meeting of the, uh, of, the, of the NATO people. I can't think of what the, <laughs> the countries involved in NATO, you know. Anyway, 
Uh, he's, not, he's not walking around. He, that's not where he's getting his work done. Jesus is getting what he gets done through his churches. And that's the problem in America today is that the churches have dropped the ball. That's the problem in the world today is that the churches have not taken up the authority Christ has given them to go forward in his name and to declare the terms of surrender. Jesus Christ is Lord, and he is risen from the dead. It's interesting, even the belief in your heart that God raised him from the dead is connected to the truth that he is Lord. Romans chapter 1, 3, he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the, resu- by the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. And so... It's really, it comes down to this. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is King. All mankind are His subjects, and we are His ambassadors, and the organizational structure that He established in the earth, the institution He put in the earth that organizes His work here on this planet is called the church. And so, when we talk about spiritual gifts, We're talking about Christ manifesting through individual believers in the church and then through the church representing Him in the world. That's the way it's supposed to work. There's the plan and the purpose. You come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 11. The Bible says that God wants Jesus, His Son, to manifest in our mortal flesh. The day will come, Philippians chapter 3, 20 and 21, when we will receive a body like unto His glorious body, and we will be like Him. We'll see Him as He is, for we shall be like Him, according to the Apostle John in his first epistle. And so, all of that's coming right now. What happens is the Holy Spirit of God dwells in our heart and moves through our belly into this world like rivers of living water. And that's the flow and the rushing of the Spirit of God through His own people who when they preach the Word of God works through the Word to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. And that's what the church is supposed to be doing. That's what the churches are all about. But we have to have the spiritual power to be effective. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. He even told them the importance of this empowerment is such that you need to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. We need to walk after the Spirit, Romans chapter 8. We need to walk and live in the Spirit, Galatians chapter number 5. We need to let the Spirit of God Fill his temple and manifest in his house that the world might know God is and that he's present in the earth by his spirit. That he has broken the power of darkness over every soul so that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We need to get that message out there. And so that's our job. Now we're going to go through these letters just briefly as I move toward the conclusion. I didn't say I was concluding. I'm getting, I'm moving in that direction. We see in the first church, Ephesus, he's standing in the midst and he's holding the seven stars. We did a lot of work on those seven stars. I mean, we, they're probably... I think there's a whole forest in Africa that got burnt up with all the paper that I used writing out my notes on what these stars are all about. Of course, I'm being facetious, but we did a lot of work on that. And it boils down to what most people commonly believe anyway, and that is that they are a reference to those persons, Jesus Christ, or that the Holy Ghost, Acts chapter 20, that the Holy Ghost has set to be overseers in the flocks, And they are the Lord's pastors. Those shepherds that he has given to his churches to feed them. Under shepherds, under him. So these angels in his hands. Someone objected to that and thought that was kind of high 
high talking, you know, you're really talking high, highly of yourself. I said, really, I'm not talking about myself at all. If I'm a, whatever part I have in any of this is a part that Jesus Christ appointed to me. It has nothing to do with me at all, other than my responsibility as a good steward to uh, fulfill my call. So, but anyway, going back to the point, this guy got a big head about that. Oh, you think you're in the hand of the Lord. I don't know why people get puffed up about stuff, but anyway. I said, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord and he turns it whatever so he will? Oh, yes, I believe in the sovereignty of God and the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. But the heart of the pastors are not. Foolishness, isn't it? People are silly. But Jesus Christ holds those shepherds in his hands through whom he feeds his flock. And, it's, he, and he's the one that's doing the feeding. Uh, the shepherd is simply doing his duty and following, um, following and carrying out his stewardship responsibility. But it's, it's ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, who is actually effecting the feeding of the heart, the feeding and the sustaining of the soul by the word of God. Only the chief shepherd can do that. And, he, and that is symbolized by him holding them in his hands. I was preaching to a group of preachers some time back and laboring on that and trying to encourage them to appreciate the significance of what that means and laid out many of the points, some of which I've laid out here, and, and encouraged them, you know, we, we need to huddle around the wound. We need to, we need to uh, ourselves, each of us, stay close to those wounds in his hands. And remember who bought, who paid for, who purchased the church, and at what cost. Now, one thing I'm always careful to tell a young pastor, if he uh, provides me an opportunity to give him any exhortation at all, I'll always include this in my, in my exhortations. You must remember the church belongs to Jesus Christ. It does not belong to you. Nor does it belong to any individual in the church or group of persons in the church. It belongs to Jesus Christ. It doesn't belong to the deacons. It doesn't belong to the committee. It doesn't belong to the pastor. It belongs to Jesus. The church belongs to Christ. We need to keep that in mind. And then in the next church, we see he is the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And we, it would really behoove us to... Uh, experience the living Lord in our own lives so that others might know, well, that he did rise again after all. Right? It'd be a good thing if, if we lived our lives in such a way that demonstrated a testimony of the truth that Jesus Christ did, in fact, rise again from the dead. And he didn't just stay there in the grave. He's alive. And that is powerfully achieved when we walk in the Spirit and the Spirit of God through us manifests Jesus in the expression of spiritual gifts. Amen? Okay. Oh, three of us. Anyway. Uh, then, then next with Pergamus, he is, the, he is that one with a sharp two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. And, and so, of course, he's speaking to his intention to come and do battle with the heretics and the false teachers that will indeed rise up among churches and even in our own church from time to time that some a little false spirit will get in there and, and start circulating a little heresy or a little false doctrine and so on. And the Word of God must be used to challenge those lies and to well, take them down by the Spirit of His mouth. The Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And of course, we need to use that sword out outside the church as well we need to take that sword with us into our neighborhoods and do battle with every lie that blinds our neighbors and keeps them under bondage to satan we need to be careful to use the word of god the apostle paul spoke about the fact that he didn't preach in word only but in word and in demonstration of the spirit i'm trying to show the connect show the connection between spiritual gifts, and all of this stuff. If you're going to use the sword of the Spirit, I guess you better remember it's His Spirit, not yours. <laughs> you can't grab it and take off without Him. You won't get much done with it. Letter kills. The Spirit gives life. 
You want to do more than just speak truth. You want to, of course, speak truth in love, and you want to speak truth under the anointing and influence of the Holy Spirit of God. At the end of the day, you don't want to talk someone into praying. You want to, however, be there when the Spirit draws someone to pray. And you want to be an instrument that He'll use to that end. But you don't want to get in between Jesus and that sinner and throw a sales pitch at him and talk him into saying a few words and then basically doing a Baptist thing like this. You're saved. Let's make sure they're responding to the Holy Spirit as he's drawing their heart and the word of God is made clear and they're coming, uh, moving toward the Lord from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. And they're moving to truth humbling themselves under the mighty hand of God and surrendering to the truth that He is Lord and not themselves nor any other. Confessing with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord means more than just open your mouth, your mouth and mouthing words. It means that you acknowledge this as true. Jesus is the Lord and He's exclusively the Lord. And so the point here is that we need the Holy Spirit in all of this. It's easy, it's too easy to get off into the flesh and to make disciples to ourselves. Some guy pointed to a drunk walking down the street while he was talking with D.L. Moody and he was a scorner and he said to D.L. Moody, he says, there's one of your disciples. D.L. Moody looked at him and said, yeah, no doubt he is. Not one of the Lord's, but he sure looks like one of mine. <laughs> so we need to be careful about that. And I'm not saying if somebody is uh, overcome by alcohol, they are therefore not saved. I'm just saying. We need to make sure the Holy Spirit is the one that's working in us and through us and with us. And that we're not out on our own doing things in the energy of our own flesh. And that's been labored on so much by so many for so long it is surprising that nevertheless so few really get it we need to be filled with the spirit walking in the spirit walking after the spirit we need these ministries of the holy spirit through us to touch the lives of others as a token and as a testimony that God is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is alive. He is not dead. He's active and present to act in our lives and through our lives and the lives of others. It's very important we understand that. Laodicea, Philadelphia, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping past a bunch of these. Thyatira, he says, the eyes of a flame of fire and feet as fine brass. You know, the church would do well to stop and remember that Jesus Christ will judge. I mean, we will face him at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm glad that when we get through the judgment seat of Christ, whatever was dealt with there will remain there. I'm glad that the eyes as a flame of fire will burn up that wood, hay, and stubble. I'm glad. I'll be glad to see it go, although... I think there'll be some time there where I'll be looking at it go and saying, wow, it could have been gold. It could have been silver. That could have been precious stones. I could have come in with so much more. Nevertheless, Father, I'm glad to see it go. Amen. Just burn it up, get it out of here, and then blow on it like chaff and let it go off and be gone. I won't go in with all the gold and all the silver and all the precious stones I might have had, but I'll go in with no doubt more than I deserve. And when I get in, I won't have any wood, hay, or stubble baggage in my life. Amen. And even if I get in there, I get in by the skin of my teeth, and I have nothing but the joy of my salvation as I carry on into heaven, I'd be far better off than I would have otherwise. Amen to that. And grateful. But I would challenge you and I would exhort you as I have so often as your pastor, please, please, 
Get your priorities sorted out. Get what matters up front. Amen? Sort all that out. Get that clear in your mind and your heart. Don't spend your life wasting it on things that are going to be burnt away at the altar. I mean, at the judgment seat of Christ. Don't do that. That doesn't glorify the Lord as much as those crowns you might have to throw at His feet would glorify Him. Go in with something for all the labor. You know, there's enough heartache, enough tears, enough sadness in this life. All by itself. Without any help from us. We don't need to contribute to it. Amen. So be careful that when we go into heaven, we go in with a full reward. That was the Apostle Paul's desire. He desired to go in with a full reward. And we should likewise remember his eyes as a flame of fire. We will fall at his feet that are as fine brass, which betokens judgment. And the seven spirits of God and the seven stars that reminded Sardis that even though they had a name that they were alive, in fact they were dead because you can have all the outward accoutrements. There's a great word. <laughs> you can have all the outward indications of, of success and favor and blessing and yet be dead on the inside. Amen. Jesus looked at a bunch of guys just like that. Said ye whitewashed sepulchres full of dead men's bones on the outside. You look all holy, holy, but on the inside you're just as unholy as the Pope. Uh, oh man. <laughs> Jesus Christ knows what's on the inside. We need to be careful that we maintain holiness. In our heart. And remember, I've taught you this many times. It begins with being honest. You've got to be honest about yourself and honest about God. When you're honest about yourself and you're honest about God, you're going to get motivated. Oh, yeah. You'll get motivated. You'll get motivated to be humble. It'll humble you. When you're honest, you'll be humble. No honest man is proud. There's no such thing as a, as a proud man that's honest. No such thing. He's lying about himself. He's lying about others. A, pride, a prideful man is not an honest man. An honest man will be a humble man. And a humble man will be a holy man. If you're honest, you'll be humble. And if you're humble, then you will move toward holiness. And you'll have power with God. Because if you submit yourself to God, then you can resist the devil. He'll flee from you. We get our work done through honest, humble holiness. Sardis reminds us of that. Philadelphia, holy and true, the Bible says, of Jesus Christ, who has the key of David, opens and shuts. And so Jesus has the authority. He has the authority to open doors. He has the authority to close doors. Jesus Christ can open Russia to the gospel. Jesus Christ, who can open Russia to the gospel, can open China to the to the gospel. Jesus Christ can open Saudi Arabia to the gospel. Jesus Christ can open Iran to the gospel. Jesus Christ can open Iraq and all the rest of them to the gospel. Now, in Iraq, it's starting to crack open a little bit. Jesus Christ can do those things. He has the key. He has the authority. He opens and he shuts. And the criteria by which he moves forward is the same criteria he used when he was here. And he said with a lament, or the Spirit said lamenting concerning Jesus, he didn't do much here because of their unbelief. Wow. Our unbelief gets in his way. And then Laodicea, finally, the amen, the faithful witness, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Well, we come to the end and we go back to the beginning. <laughs> We're at the end of the churches. Laodicea, lukewarm. So disgusted was he with him that he said, I will spew you from my mouth. I don't know about you. Can you imagine? 
hearing Jesus say that? That'd be, oh, that'd be pretty close to hearing Jesus say, Get thee behind me, Satan, like he did to Peter that one time. I often think about that. What did Peter think? What are you saying? Jesus says in this lukewarm church, eh, not so hot, eh, not so cold. You know, he would rather they be cold or hot and not diluted. Not a little bit of each. And by the way, that cold or hot doesn't mean sinful or, or holy. That's not the contrast here. I don't have time to go into it in greater detail than to say the Laodicea was situated in a place where there was cold water on one side of it and hot water on the other side of it. Cold water refreshes in its own way. Hot water has a soothing and healing effect to it in its own way. Hot water has its good uses. Cold water has its good uses. Lukewarm water has very little, use, very little uh, to be uh, spoken for it. I just, you know why I hesitated? Because I drink lukewarm water all the time. I like it better. Uh-oh. But Jesus Christ is obviously making a point, isn't he? And I think we can get the point. And he's saying he doesn't want somebody that's not full on for him, not useful, not of any real value. If we delude ourselves with the world, we compromise our ability to be effective in this world. So we need to be holy and righteous and a vessel that'll be a vessel of honor unto him that he might use. <clears throat> and what, how does he use the vessel? He manifests himself through it. All right. The whole idea of spiritual gifts is Jesus Christ getting his work done in the world through his churches. The whole idea of spiritual gifts is about Jesus Christ ministering to the body so that that body can be effective in its ministry to the world. So we need to appreciate these spiritual gifts. We need to not be ignorant about them. We need to be understanding and discerning concerning them. We need to be filled with the Spirit that they might manifest in and through our lives. Now next, I'm going to begin a series on spiritual warfare. Now you might think, Pastor, we've heard a lot about spiritual warfare over the last some years while you were writing that book and, and some other things, but you really have not heard everything that there is for you to understand about spiritual warfare. And what you will hear that you have heard before, you need to hear again. And you'll hear it, you know, there's always, there's always something new in every review. I just say that, I don't want you going to sleep on me here, because we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare. We're coming up to what is the, I'm sure, in my lifetime, is the most important election in the history of America. Of course, my lifetime doesn't comprehend the entire history of America. <laughs> but certainly, in all my lifetime, I have never lived in a moment in American history where it was more pivotal and more important ever. And when I study history, and I've studied it somewhat, I can't see another time in history where it was more critical than it is today. We are at a critical juncture. We've prayed as a church that God would make the choice clear. We don't believe in casting spells with our prayers. We don't believe, in other words, that we're going to pray, Lord Jesus, make America vote right. America is going to vote according to its heart. If it's a corrupt and wicked heart, it's going to vote corruptly and wickedly. However, I've been praying and we've been praying that God would show America the truth. That's been the focus of our prayers. And those of you who've been with us through all this know that's exactly the way I have always shaped it. I want God to take the sword of the Spirit and destroy the lies of deceit that are blinding people's minds. I don't want anybody in America going to vote blinded by some lie. If they choose the lie, let them choose the lie and die in that and lose their liberties. Because they don't deserve to have them. But I believe that there is enough redeemable in the American spirit so that if only they knew the truth, enough of them would turn and vote the right way and deliver this nation. 
I believe that. I'm not saying God has said to me that's the case, but I am saying that I feel very confident that's the truth. And so I'm praying, I have been praying, that God would reveal the truth and look at all that he has done to that end. We are going into an election year in 2020 like none I've ever seen. The, the two sides are so polarized. It's so obvious. It's so obvious. The spirit of Antichrist has come out teeth bared and claws extended and is vicious against the Lord's church and against Christians. You're hearing them say things like, we'll take away the tax-exempt status of any church that doesn't kowtow to the political correctness of the LGBTQ agenda. Tax status is really almost irrelevant to the point. The real problem with that is the idea that they're going to use the government to punish Christians because of what they believe. That's the problem with it. So, more on that as we proceed. But I'm, I've watched the Lord uh, through extensive time, periods of fasting and praying. Uh, once 14 days, uh, 7 days, uh, no water or food. Another 7 days extended with just a little bit of water. And in the course of that fasting and prayer vigil, I mean, God worked such things in my heart and gave me this confidence and kind of shaped this whole thing in my mind and my heart about what, 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 what I need to do, how to move forward in this battle. It's a spiritual battle. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're spiritual. And so I'm going to launch a series on spiritual gifts. However, I'm going to launch that December the 4th. I'm going to take the month of November and preach a series of messages on praise. The power of praise. We're going to, you're going to be amazed at the insights God has for us, for me. I need this series. And the series will bless you and help you as well. But the power and the importance of praise. That's appropriate, I think, coming into Thanksgiving and so on. And then when we come on the other side of Thanksgiving, we get to the first Wednesday in December, I will begin the series on spiritual warfare, and we'll start by going through my little book, Kingdom Power by Prayer and Fasting. Of course, we're going to be preaching from the Bible, but I'll be using that book as my outline. If you don't already have the book, get, get one. They're not too expensive. In fact, during this, during this campaign, we're going to let the book, uh, we're going to sell the book at $2.75 a piece. I mean, that's just about where the price break is for what it costs us to, to print the book. Practically giving it away. So that's what we're going to do for this particular series. And if you don't have that book, that'd be a good time to get it. I'd wait a few weeks and then buy it because it'll be cheap then. I'm just kidding around. It's only five bucks from our bookstore. How many of you already have read the book Kingdom Power by Prayer and Fasting? All right. Actually, quite a few of you have not yet read it. I would encourage you to do that. But that is going to be the outline for those messages. The first set of messages on prayer warfare, warfare is going to be prayer and fasting. I'll tell you, sir, I'll just give you a, a little tip of the iceberg on why that's important. When we get into the nitty gritty of spiritual warfare, you're going to need to be ready because Satan is going to throw an assault at you like you've never experienced before in your life. I'm telling you, Satan is up in arms right now. The kingdom of darkness is absolutely frothing and boiling with hatred and anger, and they're just about at the breaking point, and that's the spirit that works upon the children of disobedience, and that's why you're seeing them behave the way they are. They're becoming physical in their violence and becoming irrational and ridiculous. It's going to get worse before it gets better. I guarantee you that, and so we need to start our assault on the, the same way Jesus began his assault. Prayer and fasting. He took a 40-day vigil of prayer and fasting. In that prayer and fasting, he bound the strong man and proceeded there then to spoil his house. And we must follow the pattern he set for us. So we're going to focus on prayer and fasting for about 13, 14 weeks. And this is not going to just be a study thing where we're teaching you a lot of stuff. We're going to teach but do. 
We're going to reestablish the spiritual assault teams during that time. But we're going to start first with some prayer and fasting. I'm going to encourage you to fast. Fast and pray. I'm giving you further and greater insight into all of that than is even in my book. And after we get that established and we've done, got ourselves ready, we've got the house cleaned up as it were, and the vessel ready, then we're going to go into some spiritual warfare as a church. We've done it before. We saw God act. But what you're going to see next is like nothing you've seen before. Both on the side of Satan's reaction, but more importantly, on God's overcoming power. I think you're going to see a manifestation of God's overcoming power that's going to amaze you. I don't know about you, but I was amazed at some of the things God did way back then when we, did, when we first started all this. I was amazed at some of the stuff that was going on. And all that did was tell me how much more we can see. But we need to, we're going to have to charge the gates of hell with, absolute, with, with true and complete faith that Jesus Christ, His Spirit in us, is greater than the Spirit in them. Amen? We can win. Now what winning means remains to be seen. But we can win. If America does vote the wrong way, make sure it's not because you didn't step up and fight the devils that are blinding their minds and eyes and hearts. Amen? Let's make sure that when America makes its choice in 2020, it's making a choice between the spirit of Jesus Christ and the spirit of Antichrist. And people are going to line up just like that. And let's trust there will be enough strength left. He said of Philadelphia, thou hast a little strength. And I think there's still a little strength. I think there's enough for us to win. Let's stand together, please.